The, the first time I ever gave a paper at the AA meetings, Finest was my discussant. Um, and I entered with great fear and trepidation given the multitude of warnings that I was given <laughs> before the event. It turned out that uh, uh, Finus was not only encouraging but incredibly constructive and made the paper a lot better. Um, and so, you know, I, I hope that today I won't, uh, I won't, you know, be be given what I'm long past due in terms of uh, being chastised for my mistakes. Um, for those of you who were here for uh, Bob Fogel's memorial service, Jim stood up uh, and, and talked about Fogel as being part of a tradition, and, and, and Jim went back to Kuznets and kind of, I think, maybe back into the 1800s. And I won't do that, but I'll talk about people that I've known here at Chicago that I think are part of a tradition of saying that it's important to work with large data sets that deal with big questions and cover large populations and really understand how they were collected and what the information is that's really in them and how they speak to basic canonical economic models and how the models maybe need to change and how we need to think about policy. And I view, um, you know, Fogel and Finus and, and Jim Heckman and, uh, and Bob Willis and, and Jim Smith, all as being people when I was um, young who I, I looked at and I said, you know, I want to do that. I want to, I want to be part of that enterprise. And um, this paper, I hope, is very much part of that tradition. It's part of uh, some work that I've done. Uh, uh, the first paper in this line of research was one in a, in a volume that Finus edited. Um, but I think also I'm encouraged that, you know, Eric Hurst and Kerwin are also, I think, part of this tradition. And we found out that Michael Greenstone just said yes, and we're going we're gonna to add to that tradition. And so um, I, I feel very honored to be here and, um, and, uh, and be part of this today. So very quickly, because we got 92 pages of tables and figures and text in 25 minutes. <coughs> 18 minutes, got to go fast. All right, the, 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 the best work done on black-white economic inequality and how it changed over the 20th century was all done by people that were either on our faculty or got their PhD here, and I don't think there's any doubt about that. And uh, Finus and, and Jim, you know, documented that there was an amazing amount of progress, and they did this uh, by, you know, getting electronic versions of the census files up and running, okay? And there's a, there's a paragraph at the end of their famous JL piece that says, we're not sure this is going to continue. Things don't look good here in the late 80s and things that we're seeing, not enough data to know, but we're not sure this is going to continue. And I wrote a paper in 2006 focusing on the test scores, the education, et cetera, and saying, you were right, it didn't continue. And now I want to pick up with the economics part of it, the labor market outcomes, and I want to show you that if you start counting the people in prison, you'll see that the economic progress didn't continue either. And then I want to show you towards the end that when we think about the prison boom and why it happened, it's very important to realize that you can show that the prison boom was the creation of a policy change. And this work is joint with Armin Rick, who's a graduate student here. He also does theory, and he's on the job market, and he's polishing his job market paper today. But he was instrumental uh, in doing a very finest-like thing. He was the person, we had thousands of pages of code books on these Justice Department data sets. He was the one that figured out, well, if we use this series and we piece together this and we, we can find the group of states that are reporting real data and not junk data, and we can do these simulations with these time series. 
And um, so at the end, I'll show you the evidence that it really was a policy choice to create the prison boom. And then the question that is unanswered for this paper, but is the research agenda, is how much of the bad labor market outcomes are just changes in the wage structure, but how much was added to it by locking people up for long periods of time that in the past we didn't lock up? And I don't have an answer to that, but I think it's a good research agenda once you realize that the locking everyone up was a policy choice. Okay, so you're, I, <coughs> I couldn't figure out a way to get this on a readable slide. Um, and I wasn't gonna be like Jim and put 5,000 uh, numbers, Jim Heckman, and put 5,000 numbers on one slide. Um, so I gave you a handout here. So do table 11. Okay, so let me tell you how we created these numbers. The 10, 25, 15, 15, 25, 10, okay, the, what we're saying here is we're gonna take data from the census long form in the ACS. We're gonna assume that all the people who are in prison have a wage offer that is below the median wage offer of people in their race and potential experience cell, and we're defining potential experience as in Smith and Welch. And then for the people that remain that are not workers for the whole year, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have different mixing rates. So 1025 says that 10% of the white um, missing observations are really above the median. I'm, I'm sorry, 25% of the white are above the median and 10 of the black. And then the opposite for 25-10, and then 15-15 is we're saying that 15% of the missing are above the median. Okay, and so what you get is you, and we use these based on data that we saw in the NLSY for people that didn't work several years and then worked where they appeared to be in the wage distribution. And what you see when you look at the table is that if you look at 1970 to 2010, if you just look at the raw numbers, which is if we took the ratio of median wages for the people who were actually employed you would always in each of these groups say, well, there was tremendous progress. There was you know, somewhere from eight log points to 13 log points in terms of growth over that period. But if you look at any of the selection corrected results, you see either no progress or regress or very little progress. And so kind of regardless of how you do the selection correction, it's very hard to see that there is any real progress from 1970 to 2010 in the center of the wage distribution. Table 12 in the, in the paper um, shows you what's going on at the 75th and 95th. There was a little progress there in the 80s, but nothing in the 90s. The thing that you wanna notice is that this is a story of basically stagnation in the 70s, declines in the 80s, progress in the 90s, stagnation till 2007, everything falls apart in the Great Recession. Look at what happens to the employment rates for blacks between 2007 and 2010. It's truly shocking. Yes, Kevin. I was just saying, for the trend stuff, you might want to stop in 07. I'm not sure you want to interpret 10, 2010 as like telling us the trend. Okay, that's a fair point. I would point out that if you do 1970 to, to, to 2010, I mean 2007, then it becomes more of which select, selection correction you want to pick. But what will remain true is even if you stop in 2007, what you have in the raw numbers is a gross overstatement, a gross overstatement of the progress, and there's still gonna be very little progress between 1970 and 2007. When you throw in the Great Recession, a lot of these cells, you get regress. The other thing I would say, uh, 2010, 
the cyclical distribution of guys who drop out are different than the cyclical the, the trend distribution. Bob and I did thing on that. Should, you might want to think about different imputation kind of, for the cyclical version. The kind of imputation that we did would be telling the guys who weren't working look awful lot like the guys who worked around the 13 weeks on the CPF. So you could impute off of those low weeks guys and probably do a better you got your thing open. Send me an email with a reference. So, <laughs> your your lap your laptop. <laughs> no, no, but I would I, I, I we want to try that. We're 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 in the final stages of revising this before we send it back to the journal. We we found it was pretty compelling that the guys who didn't work 52 weeks looked an awful lot like the guys who worked one to 13. So we use the wages of the guys in the 13 and the guys who are out. Okay. Think about it, but go ahead. All right, all right. So, so, so that's what we get from the wages. Um, and, you know, Jim, Jim knows a lot about this, so he'll have more to say. What I want to show you now <coughs> is this equation. If you look at the literature in criminology and sociology on prison growth. This is what they use. The steady state incarceration rate is the rate of people who are kind of actively engaged in crime minus uh, the ones locked up times the probability that you're arrested given that you're engaged in crime times the probability that you're convicted given that you're arrested times the probability that you're admitted given conviction times the expected time served. And so what people have done in the past in this literature is they have tried to measure these things over time and they talk about this parameter and changes it as evidence on admissions policies and they talk about movements in S bar as telling you something about changes in sentencing policies. So if we're looking to see whether mandatory minimums, three strikes you're out, et cetera, mattered, people look at S bar. Well, that's wrong because it's S bar given that you went in prison. And so there's a lot of confusion in the literature where we didn't see huge changes in average sentence length while the prison boom was going on and people said, well, it can't be the sentencing. But what was going on is that this was changing in a way such that the expectation that you would get five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years in prison given that you were convicted was going up for each one of those numbers. <laughs> so it was sentencing that drove the prison boom. Uh, and this, this is just evidence that this, is, this bad way of doing things was the way it was done in the past. And this is the claim, this is my way of doing it. I say what's on the slides before I hit the button. Um, here's a better approach. Think about that average sentence length as just a weighted sum of probabilities. The probability that you get one year, the probability that you get two years, et cetera. And then think of a policy change as multiplying those probabilities by some k greater than one. And that means we're going to make it more likely that you, and now you could do KSJ, the probability that you get a sentence of S for crime J being greater than one. And now <clears throat> um, realize that we could make all the Ks bigger and get no change in S bar, okay? And, and that's right here. In fact, in the one where K is constant, you make K as big as you want to, make the prison population as big as you want to, and S bar never changes, okay? So, uh, what we've got here is <coughs> in what we did was two things. One, say you need to look at it through that lens, and that's the way to see what's going on, which is, I think, a very finest way to do things. And the other is we clean the data that no one else could figure out how to use. And Armin gets huge credit for figuring out how to make sense out of the National Corrections reporting data, which is sent from the states to the feds. And the states, don't have, uh, the feds don't have any power over the state, so a lot of states send junk data. But there are eight states where you can do a lot of consistency checks between the release files, the parole files, and the admission files, 
and see that the data is adding up. And there's a long appendix about how Armin went through and made sure we had the right eight states. And then these turned out to be the eight states, California, Colorado, Michigan, North Dakota, New Jersey, South Carolina, Washington, and Wisconsin. And then <clears throat> if you look at the other handout, what you see is the ratio that's in bold is the K for each one of those crimes and how it changed from 1985 to 2000. So what you're doing is taking the number of people arrested for a crime in a given year and then asking if we start following how many people went into prison for that crime and stayed these different intervals. And what you'll notice if you look at the nonviolent crime, all the K's are bigger than one, and a lot of them are huge. And for nonviolent crime, people don't serve more than five years usually. So what you're getting is kind of the whole story out of this table for nonviolent crime. In the, in the paper we do, and the K's are bigger for whites than for blacks. In other words, the, there is no evidence that this change in policy was directed toward blacks. There is a little bit of evidence that they were already being picked on when it started. Um, but the changes if anything, were against whites. The reason it harmed blacks so much is they have arrest rates that are four to five times the arrest rates for whites. So if you have a policy that says we're going to be hard on all arrested offenders, it's really going to affect the black population more than the white. Now you might see that there are a few numbers less than one for murder, rape, and robbery. What's going on there is we could only show you out to five years. We've gone back and done 95 to 2005. The admission rates for these crimes went up. So the people that went to prison went up. So if these numbers are less than one for the short sentences, that tells you there's some numbers for 9, 10, 11, 12 that are much bigger than one. And so what happened for violent crime is the number of people who went up went into prison, went up, and we shifted the whole distribution. And so conditional on being a murderer or a rapist, you can actually see both the admission probability go up and the time served distribution shift to the right. And if you want to see <clears throat> the total effect of this, we, we found a way, Armin found a way to use the inputs <coughs> that we have in these files to run simulations. And so what we have is we have in 1985, we can calculate the probability that an arrested offender goes to prison. We can calculate the probability that a person who's been on parole for P years enters prison. We can calculate uh, probabilities in the future with S equals one to 20 for exits from prison to parole, prison to freedom, and then we can do the parole revocations back in. We can do this separately for each crime for three different races, black, white, and other, and for California, and then everybody else lumped together. Okay? And so then we got this huge matrix of probabilities that describe all the movements in and out of prison for a group of arrested offenders based on what policy was for the people who went in in 1985. Okay, then we can just run the arrest from 1985 through 2005 through that simulation and ask the question, if we ignore the feedback and say the arrests are what the arrests are, what would the prison population have looked like over the years if we had kept the 85 policies in place? And here's the answer. It, <clears throat> we have prisons at the end of 85, so that's the, the year under the 85 policies, like 105,000 in these states. State prisons go to 326. It would only be 165 if you kept the old policies, okay? And so that turns out to be, <coughs> that turns out to be 70% of the growth is above and beyond what you would have had with this series of arrests and the old policies. That doesn't take into account the fact that 
Part of the growth and arrest was due to demography, and these prison populations would have grown by 6% if you just kept the, the demographic representation the same. And so it turns out that based on this, you get about four-fifths of the prison growth is policy. If you adjust for incapacitation and you find the biggest number that we can find, which was produced by my colleague Steve Levitt, then it changes to 189, but you're still talking about, once you adjust for the demography, you're talking about two-thirds at a minimum. And, and given how much bigger Steve's estimates of the incapacitation effects are than any you could possibly find, this is very, two-thirds is kind of a lower bound on the role of policy in these eight states in terms of creating the prison growth. The last thing, this is Gary saying, you can run these separately for whites and for blacks. If you do this quickly, you'll see that the, the widening, the gap growing is as big or bigger for whites in percentage terms as it is for the blacks. And so what we have here. <clears throat> I think there's some evidence out there that within these categories you have the severity of the crime has been changing over time too. So a drug bust in 85 was, you know, to, to simplify, was a guy selling an ounce of dope of marijuana, and now it's somebody selling crack or something like that. Are you controlling for that kind of stuff? What we have is we have separate for drug trafficking and for um, drug possession. And what we are recording in the arrest data is the most serious thing that you were charged with in the arrest files. Yeah. The, most, the distribution of the most serious, I think, changed over time. And that's when you contribute to something. You're going to attribute that to policy when it may not be policy at all. Maybe the severity of crimes is in the category. So you're saying that a drug trafficking arrest in. In 2005, not me, not might not be the same arrest as in 1985. Right, and if you look at within these categories, the, the distribution of, uh, of black crime tends to be a little bit more towards the severe end of the distribution than the distribution of white crime. But now that that doesn't that doesn't accord with your other, other finding. You're saying the gap up is bigger for for whites than for blacks, and you wouldn't have expected to find that big gap. So there's some, there's some there's, there, we, right. But we get the same type of patterns here. We get the same, those Ks, the biggest Ks that we found mm -hmm. were for motor vehicle theft and simple assault and the drug crimes. Now, um, some people have said to me one thing that fits your story, that people who are arrested for motor vehicle theft now are organized crime as opposed to guys on joy rides because we have all this low jack and GPS stuff and they concentrate their efforts on career criminals. So the motor vehicle theft is the one, it's a, it's a K of like five or six for those sentences of three, four, five years. So you're, you're increasing by, <clears throat> by you know, a factor of three, four, five, the probability that you serve a long prison term. That's the only one where someone's told me a concrete story, you know, that was fully fleshed out about why the police were, you know, arresting career criminals versus others. But it's a small part, motor vehicle theft is a small part of the prison population. I'm three minutes over and, uh, oh, okay. All right. All right. So, um, <clears throat> Now you're done. Now I'm done. <laughs> no, no, this was the last slide. I, I, I tried to make sure that I, I didn't, I didn't want to, I didn't want to, you know, uh, since the paper is following up in many ways, honors my discussant's work. I didn't want to run into his time. All right. <clears throat> Otherwise, I always give the <laughs> okay then. <laughs> and this is a warning to Derek. <laughs> I received the paper two days ago, and as he said correctly, 90 pages with not double space, single space, tons and tons of numbers. So this is my warning. In California, 
That justifies a citizen's arrest, <laughs> conviction without trial, and long jail, jail time. And there are people serving that sentence already. So there are really two parts to this paper. And um, I, you know, basic bottom line is I really like this paper a lot. I think it's saying something very, very important, especially on the role of crime and all the dimensions of crime. And the first part of the paper, which is actually the much longer part, is on the quality and use of administrative da data on the criminal justice system. Both in, it, it goes in very much detail on arrests and convictions and prisons, how you can use these data, how you put them together. And it's, it's an impressive uh, piece of work. And I recommend it. It's also, when you read it, you say, thank God I didn't have to do this and someone else did this, but it's really impressive, both in the doing of it and in the information that comes out. And the second part is the application to changing uh, racial wage disparities over time, and I'll spend a little more time on that. But the basic uh, thing that impressed me is because criminal activity and understanding criminal activity and its impact on the labor market is really, really important because of the changes that have taken place over time. And racial wage differences is just one application. There are many, many other things uh, that are important. You know, what happens to people if they get arrested? And let's say they're not convicted, or, or, but they get arrested. What happens to their future labor force activity? We don't know a lot about this. And I think uh, Derek and Rick have put this out there so that it's going to be much easier. This is uh, some information. I've actually got in, into this a, li a little bit myself in recent years. This is data I, I had from the uh, PSID. By age 22, a quarter of men have been arrested at least once. Most of these people, most of these men have been arrested at more than once. Right. So I, I I knew nobody when I was young who had been arrested. Absolutely, it was exception of finest. <laughs> Sorry about it. But he was way older, so it doesn't count in this. And when you look at it by income decile, not surprisingly, it's concentrated in the lower income decile. The, you know, a quarter of people have been arrested. I, I, I checked and checked and checked, and these are, from this source and other sources, what the numbers say. This is what they were arrested for. I highlighted in um, yellow what I would consider more serious types of crime, not just um, um, AWOL or drinking uh, and things like that, but these are serious crimes that matter committing, many of them, and especially, again, in the bottom part of the income distribution. I, I didn't, I, I looked for it, for, given the paper, I was, when I originally put them together, I, I didn't do that, and it would have been very useful for this, but it can be done, it's the uh, PSID uh, transition to adulthood data, so. And I'm going to speak more about new data that's coming online. Uh, so in a lot of the paper, um, Derek and Rick go through looking at uh, the probability of arrest, the probability of conviction given arrest, the probability of jail time, and how much jail time you serve. And what they conclude, and I, I, I think they're right, is these trends in uh, conviction and in jail time are driving a lot of the trends over time in people out of the labor force because of this increase in criminal activity over time. And I, I just think that's a major contribution, job well done. This is what the, the this arrest data look like. I take the same age. In the 60s, it was one in five. I'm surprised that's so high, but it, it's definitely been growing over time and with more serious offenses. So as I said before, this is really important. The other um, thing you get when you read um, the paper is this administrative data. They, they did the best job possible, pick the six states you can say something this data is terrible, really, really bad. It's, it's uh, they ought to be arrested, the people who put this together. 
But there's hope on the way. I am putting into the PSE, PSID next year a module that includes everyone's history of arrest, conviction, and uh, jail time, and the reasons. So it's not going to be embedded in a data set we all use, and that's going to make research on these questions and the larger questions about the role of criminal activity in the labor market much easier to, to deal with. So let me say a few things about the racial wage disparity and the application to that. And for this, I'm going to have a few questions and also um, um, I'm going to make a point about something else that's going on that I think you have to bring into the paper because there are alternative explanations for the lack of racial progress in the wages. And I think if you don't say anything about them, then it's hard to interpret what the role of criminal activity really is. So let me, uh, th this is um, from a paper I did after Finance uh, on the um, education gap, uh, racial education gap, also for young people. And you can see that in the 90s, which is the most recent period, the improvements in among young people in terms of the narrowing of the education differences had really stopped. So, the, but it stopped at a very low level compared to history. So, there wasn't much room left for education to be driving anything with these low levels. Uh, black, young black men had the same problem young white men have, getting past graduating from high school and getting going to college. I mean, that, that seemed to be the big stop, stopping point. This is medium, median differences in years of schooling? Mean differences in years of school, yeah. Okay, just want actually to read it. Th this is, um, Table five, this is a question. That's not something I um, know the answer to, but uh, in this table, Derek shows what's happening to employment trends of black males, and also what's happening to jail, people being incarcerated in, in, in jails. And at the very bottom, I do the deltas over time, and you can see that there's really big employment change, and I was surprised by the magnitudes of the employment change. There is an increase in incarceration rates, but they're nowhere near the same. It's about a quarter of, or a fifth of the, uh, you can explain about a fifth of the drop in the employment rates uh, for black men by incarceration. So something else is going on. I don't know what it is. People in this room probably know what it is, but I don't, and I think that should be addressed. Same thing for people less than high school, it's the same puzzle. What, where, what else is going on that's driving um, black men out of the labor force? The, the, and this will be my final point. This is the alternative explanation. This is what's happening to the wage gap uh, with uh, whites for both Hispanics and blacks. And you can see the stagnation that Derek is talking about in, in the more recent period of time. And that's the education data I showed before, and it's flattened out. But so the, the other thing that people in this room have written about is the expanding wage uh, gaps by the, uh, the fact that both people above the median have much faster wage growth than people below the median. This is uh, what was happening to that. The blue is the median, and you can see people above the median had wage, significant wage growth. Those below had significant wage declines. If my memory is correct, the average black is at the, if the white is the median, the average black would be 33% down. So if I took this, that would explain, not only explain, this would drive a lot of the narrowing of the wage gap. If I corrected for this, failure. yes, if I corrected for this, then I'm going, I would change the question. Why are blacks doing so well? And then I would put the, the prison data on top of this. Use this as the, uh, as the benchmark, not the observed series, because this is playing a powerful role in that. So a really good paper, and that's it. Okay. I, Derek, yeah, you want to so a little I, I, I would just like to say that I don't, uh, Obviously. Should we get close to each other? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I
I, w I would like to thank Jim, and um, I guess I, I need to do a better job of, of, of writing the conclusion. I, I don't think we have a disagreement. I, uh, the, the thing that I think is incredibly clear is that you can't get an accurate reading on what black, white, and quality among males is now unless you find a way to count the prison population. And it's also clear that this prison boom has been coincident with the change in the wage structure. And it's also clear that the prison boom was more than just the change in the wage structure, it was a change in policy. Because conditional on how much people were arrested involved in crime, we locked them up at a much greater rate. What is unclear is whether or not there's a feedback loop. What is unclear is whether or not the locking people up for much longer actually degraded their human capital and attachment to work even faster than would have been the case without the prison boom. And I, and I don't have an answer to that yet. It's something that I want to explore, but it's already 92 pages and we just want, we wanted to stop here with kind of establishing these facts in, in much the way that I think the original paper did in terms of there was a whole lot that came after that paper kind of arguing about what it means and extending the research further, but it was important to get on the table, these are the facts. Any questions about that? Yeah, yeah, it seems like a very interesting paper, Derek. Um, on, on policy change, including what are the policy change, look at the federal level. You see a minimum sentence of requirement. You don't have to do everything with states. No, no, we, uh, the 25 minute version does states. It's, it, the federal is, is crystal clear that it's all drugs, weapons, immigration. Now, the question I had about the states was, how much vary, your state, each state makes its own policy. How much variation do you find in different states' policy changes in regard to uh, the mission of the prison? So there's two ways to answer that. One is it's almost impossible to code that up because laws that have the same name mean different things in different states and laws that have different names do the same thing in different states. So no one's found a way to put an index on that. If you do these indirect measures so far, we haven't, we saw both in the small states and in California, other places, we saw pretty much the same pattern. There's some evidence that I read about in the literature, although we don't have the data, and I don't know how good the data is other people are using, that there are a few states like Minnesota that have an explicit sentencing commission and their mission in the statute is make sure the prison population fits in our prisons so we don't have to build more prisons. And those states, there's just a few of them, appear to have been a little different. But what I will say, and this is something, is also a big data gathering effort, I believe the answer here is related to prison construction. The 1994 federal truth and sentencing law had a part of it that said, if you as a state will make people serve 85% of whatever they're sentenced, we will build your prisons for you. And one of the things that's been very clear since the Great Recession started, and this prison boom has leveled off or even gone this way, you can't keep the prison boom going without prison construction. The Supreme Court told California, in their infinite wisdom, 137% of design capacity is all the Constitution allows. And so um, that combined with the state budget problems, this is leveled off. But for the 90s and the 2000s, the federal government was building the prisons that made this possible. Yeah. I was very interested in the non-employment part. So uh, non-employment has been uh, increasing a lot more, as you know, uh, was just said. So I wonder if you could do a toy model saying, you know, if once you've been in prison, you're more likely to be non-employed, and how much would that effect, how big would that effect be, so that you can fully explain the rise in non-employment as well. The 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 problem is. The, the problem is that the, the national data where we get the stocks, we don't have the tenures. So we just know people are there in the census, but we don't know how long they've been there. 
and the one and the data where we know how long you've been and when you came in and how long you stayed, um, we only have that for eight states and we don't see what happens after you leave. And, and we see people come back in, but we can't link them. Ho we're hoping in this data project that I'm working on now at Chapin Hall to put together an enclave, we're hoping at least for Illinois in the future to have a data set where you can follow kids from school and have their school experience in and out of the courts and in and out of jobs so that you can have all this in one data set. And, and we just got money from Spencer and the Milgram Foundation to put together that capacity, but I don't think any place has it yet. Joe Doyle's doing a little bit of this at MIT, but to systematically have it all in one data set, we're, we're building the machine now to try to do that. Has Jeff Drucker done anything? Uh, there's California data in which you put together criminal life history, uh, incarceration, et cetera. Uh, and I know at one time there was plan to link that uh, with the unemployment insurance data so you could track employment. Has he proceeded with that? Kerwin, no. I, I think, yeah. It we're, be done. Yeah, it, 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 if we get all the lawyers to sign, it can be done for Illinois too, and we're trying to do it. Great. Um, so you talk a lot about this being a policy change in the 80s. I mean, there's also the, the rap rise of crack cocaine, right? Do you think of that as a okay, so, as, as interacting with the policy change? No, so one of, the, one of the reasons we know it's a lot more than that is that if you look at the uh, crime rate starting in the late 90s and the arrest rate starting in the late 90s, everything except drugs starts down. But the prison population keeps growing. And so when you ask me, well, you're saying that there's maybe 20%, maybe 25% out here that's not policy, what would that be? I would say part the, the terrible stuff that went on in the late 80s and the first half of the 90s, you know, the people that are still there who were the most violent criminals, they'll be part of that residual. Um, but the prisons kept growing rapidly until the late 2000s, even though everything except drug crime started to turn down in the late 90s or even the mid-90s. Yeah. In terms of, I haven't had a chance to work with the paper on this, but in terms of the decomposition between admission and duration, I mean, those decompositions are always a bit dangerous, right? Because if they're sentencing people in any sensible way, you would think if your duration policy was held constant, average duration would fall as you admit more people. Because you're going to be admitting, hopefully, the guys who didn't commit as serious of crimes as the guys who were already in there. So kind of interpreting it as, you know, conditional on entry, how does the distribution change? That's sort of how does the sentencing change? not really, I don't think, a very good way to think about it. Yeah, there's three pages of the, of, the, of the paper that's saying criminology has always done that, and that is stupid. <laughs> and and the, the reason that I passed out, the, the, the reason that I passed out the... No, but you can't, what you did here... No, the, this one, this one here. The your, ratio one. Yeah, yeah I, I intentionally don't do what they did. What you're doing here is this is of, out of the fraction arrested. I understand. And, and so I'm able to show you that the, the density went up at every point. I understand. Yeah. But if you, to, to know what's happening to duration decisions for given individuals. I don't have the, the data. The population of who's getting admitted is changing dramatically. Hopefully. Right. Right. Out of the, if you hold the, out of a given, say out of a thousand people arrested for motor vehicle theft, what we have is a lot more going into prison for one year, for two year, for three year, for four year, for five year. And the only way to get that is to have a, a, a shift in sentencing that's more severe. Because more people are getting long, more people are getting medium, more people are getting short. No, that's his point. <clears throat> if you reduce the arrest rate, so you only go for more serious offenders, holding everything else constant, every duration will increase at every single point of distribution. Yes. 
Okay. You got that? Yeah. Okay, so you're 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 saying you're saying what Bob said before. Yeah, the, that I have to work the so here's the here's the response to that. The crime rates track the arrest rates. No, but even when in arrest, you have the admission rate. When the admission rate goes up, the duration distribution would naturally get shorter. Right. But how do you know by how much? Because you bring in list series. Yes. Right. What I'm saying is, is that there's no way, there's two, there's two things on the table here. One is that maybe arrests went down because now we're only arresting the most severe guys. That would be a problem for me, but the crime rates track the arrest rates, so I'm not worried about that. The second thing is you're saying that if we have this policy that says we're going to lock more people up, we're going to be locking up marginal guys that used to get probation, you would expect SBAR to shrink. I agree with that. I say that in the paper. And so what I say is we shouldn't be focused on average sentence. We should be focused on looking at, given that so you're... You're not, you're not trying to decompose between no. sentencing. I misunderstood what you said. I'm, I'm, saying, saying. I'm saying do this and look at the whole density and quit trying to decompose it because you can't. Yeah. They were trying to do something you couldn't do before. Okay. This is it. This is the last one. So actually, I just wanted to follow up on uh, Jimmy's comments about the percentiles of blacks in the wage distribution. That's, I mean, there's a, it's interesting. This is, goes back to the Junior European Bell paper from 1991, right, on accounting for the black-white uh, divergence or convergence. I'm just wondering if you have you explored you know, how much just using kind of basic wage structure facts you would have expected? And I mean, I guess that's a little contaminated because whites, even if you compare to white wage structure, white incarceration is also going up a good deal. Uh, but it seems like... Uh, the, the, here's the, here, here's, and I'll be glad to go into this, yeah. but here's the thing that's harder about that than what I did. So if I'm just interested at one place in the distribution, I can make an assumption about this fraction of the ones that are missing or above it or below it. That's why you do a Bob said. Then you impute the whole distribution. That's 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 a very Smith and Welch thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> right? The, the the expected the expected wage is what we see among those that work, times the probability that work, and then we you you know, and I I was doing something uh, I was doing this in part because it was different, but in part because it allowed me to um, it allowed me to play with a range of rules that I felt I had more confidence in in, in terms of saying it was a bound. I felt that 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 twenty five that ten twenty five column on the right. I think that's the best you could hope for in terms of what's going on for blacks. Okay, thank you, Derek. We're a little over.